think it's the 29th of May, 30th, 30th. 30th already. <laughs> We're in uh, Pretoria, South Africa, and um, I'm. Uh, we're talking about the concept of unbounded organization, and I'm hoping that uh, Gavin uh, Anderson will be able to uh, tell us somewhat impromptu uh, how he came up with the idea, where it came from, and, and um, so I'd like to uh, ask him to try to formulate the, uh, the concept in the light of its uh, something of his own history and, 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 and its origins as well as the concept. I think that's one of the merits of the idea. It's an idea that grows out of practice. It's not just an idea. Thanks, Alan? Howard. So um, I suppose the, the understanding that I've always had about organization is that it's, it's what we do to, to maintain livelihoods, to advance as a people, um, to uh, build on, on existing knowledge and, and create new knowledge. And I suppose that the two big situations in my, in my early life that, that kept this idea of all of us working together in one, there's a one kind of organizational imperative. The first is that the first six years of my life I, I spent on an island called Tristan de Kuna where um, there were kind of almost rituals and rhythms of of work and life, where um, some days would would be days for the patches, where everyone went to the potato patches and minded them, and banked the soil over the potatoes. There were fishing days. There were there was a ratting day where the whole island, everybody uh, from young to old, got together to catch rats and kill them. <laughs> so that they didn't take over the island. There was a happling day where everyone got in boats and went around to the other side of the island where there were these wild apple trees growing and they'd, they'd pick all the apples and put them in the, the boats and bring them back and bottle them and do make pie and do all sorts of jam, everything you can mm -hmm. think of. Reminds me of Babar the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so mm -hmm. you know, there were days to go to where, where um, they take the fishing boats and go to, to Inaccessible, which was this island peak coming in, a volcanic peak coming out of the ocean. But with, um, at the top of it, there was a crater where um, water had, had um, precipitated and, and so sort of very rich agriculture. And they'd put pigs there. And so once a year, everyone go across and kill the pigs the fattest pigs, bring them down into the boats and then come back again. And there was another day where everyone would go to, to Nightingale, which was a, another um, little island, just rocks, but where all the birds were. And they'd, they'd get bud eggs, bird eggs of different kinds and bring them back. So there were the whole, you know, there were, there were times for, for feasts and celebrations, there were, there were rituals of religion and all of that. And, and so I, I grew up um, with that, that imagery of, of a whole people doing things together, working together, thinking about stuff together. Um, now, although we left there when I was six, I, you know, the thing is that our whole family was, was uh, it was a huge experience for everyone. So my parents talked about that well into my teens. So I think that's the one uh, sense of, of everyone working together, one unbounded organization, if you like. Yeah? And then when I was a teenager, we were in Botswana, and Sretz Kama led us to independence. And again, there was the sense that we were all somehow responsible, <coughs> we had something to do, we had a role to play. We, we almost dedicated our every day towards some some goal, you know, that we were going to become an independent nation kind of thing. So that again, no matter where the different work uh, was, you know, my father was a meteorologist, my mother uh, was, was a nurse working with the Red Cross. Um, but somehow it all contributed to the whole. So, so I, I had this sense quite 
strongly of, of uh, one common um, yearning, I suppose. Um, and then coming to South Africa to study, you know, I got involved in, in, in political work because I, I really didn't like apartheid and ended up, um, first of all, helping to start what's now called NUMSA, the National Union of Metal Workers, but then got banned and, and had to work. Um, I learned to be, uh, I earned a living as a carpenter, but worked underground building political organization. And again, the thing driving us, whatever we were doing in our everyday work, was the idea of a, of a new society, a different kind of a, a place that's worthy of our children, a place that, that uh, we would, that is, gives best expression to, to who we are and, and who, and what humanity has striven for over time. So, so I think, you know, that there's always been for me this, this, this separation of almost these two levels of organization, the what you do every day to keep alive and keep afloat, but then the, the thing that you're contributing to, which is a shared enterprise of all of us. So, so that's the first kind of groundings, I think, is, is just my own experience of, and, and the f feeling that there's only real meaning in life when you are contributing to something uh, greater than just your everyday. Um, yeah, then do you want me to continue talking a bit about the organization workshops and stuff like that? Or yes, I don't know if you want to take a rest or you can... Or no, you I can, can, we can go on. Yeah, I'd like you to talk too about organizing cooperatives in Botswana. Yeah, okay. So, um, when I was in Botswana, um, you know, I came from South Africa um, having having been immersed for ten years in political organization here and trade union organization an underground organization above ground organi all th I, I learned an incredible amount mostly from from workers how to organize factories how to organize in the townships and when I got back to Botswana I found that that um, somehow my my ability in organization had far exceeded that of my friends and, and colleagues that I'd grown up with and, and began to realize that organization itself is, a, is a, an, it's an area of literacy, if you like. It's a, it's a field of knowledge. It's, a, it's, it's an area of, of, um, of skill and, and a discipline. I don't know. That it's something it's, it's maybe the key thing needed to make, uh, to, to succeed in, in society. And um, the difference in Botswana was that I was organizing, whereas here we'd been organizing against the state, not only organizing for a, a dream of a liberated society, but the organization, the day-to-day -day was very much to, to um, block the apartheid state and to render it ineffectual. Um, and when getting to Botswana, there was this sudden excitement about being able to organize for, organize day to day in, in ways that would that improve people's lives. And in the first place I started to work was in a wood workshop in, in Otsi, um, where there was very small turnover, there was no uh, the, the labor process wasn't divided at all. The, you know, one person would take wood and take it through all the different stages and produce a product. It was an artisanal labor process. And that's how we'd worked, in fact, at the Woodworkers Cooperative here when, when I was banned. Um, but in, in Otsi, the first thing that I was hired as the, as the production manager to get the factory going and spent a long time just getting to know everybody and, and, and being accepted, but then proposed that we, we do two things. First of all, that we move to worker self-management, but that we, the second thing, which would allow the self-management, in fact, was to divide the labor process. So we, we, st we had a, a machining team, I mean, a yeah, planing team preparation of the wood, 
the machining, that's the cutting and, and you know, making the mortises and tenons and all that, assembly team, finishing, and dispatch. And, and once we were organized into those teams, we could then plan the whole production process. And, and um, production shot up. Um, so we had this really lovely thing of worker self-management coupled with a tenfold increase in, in production. Which w it was very exciting. So the, the, the workshop succeeded. It started to support a school for handicapped kids. And then we, we, started, we realized that mainly we'd, we'd created work for, for men and that we needed something for women. And so uh, at a certain point I left and, and started working with a group of 30 women. We started a bakery. And, and with that led, I, I met some other people, two friends who, who were also involved in organizing different kinds of production cooperative. Um, yeah, the bakery was a cooperative. It was the, the, the woodwork shop was self-managed woodworking factory under a community trust. The bakery was a cooperative and then we started to travel to different parts of Botswana um, by bus, sometimes hitchhiking to, to work with people to help them start their own um, small production ventures. And that led eventually to an organization called CORD, which, um, which grew quite big and, and worked across Botswana, but also had some activities in, in neighboring countries. Um, and, you know, after a while I realized that, that uh, although we were working hard and we had good ideas and we were um, very, I suppose, very competent at what we were doing. It was only in, in exceptional cases that the businesses would succeed. And I began to realize that the, the key issue is that we were, we were focusing just within the business, within the cooperative, looking at the dynamics within it, and then relating outwards only in terms of, of um, sourcing supplies and marketing our product. And, and start to realize that any small community business can only succeed if, the, if it's t um, accepted and welcomed and supported by the bigger society. So again, had this experience of something that, that uh, uh, you, the, the, the whole theory of business, you know, with, with uh, our, the competitive advantage and our core, our niche role and, and our um, distinctive product and all of that, that that has a great, it, it, it's very useful and it makes sense within the, the terms of the, of the small enterprise, but actually ignores all of the bigger issues that need to be there, be in place before, before a small business at any rate can, can um, succeed. So, so I began to realize that if we wanted to talk about any business, you need to talk about the whole of society working in a particular way. So, so those, those are just, um, I didn't yet have any kind of theory about it, but, but just kind of painful experience, I suppose, you know, that because uh, code is about seven or eight years of, of working very hard and eventually you know, thousands and thousands of families involved through through uh, people in uh, who who were working in the various enterprises that were members of Cord, but somehow we were we we weren't we weren't quite m uh, getting where we wanted to go. You know, um, I remember that time reading a, something as the Sarvodya movement in Sri Lanka, and and where where you had the same kind of organization of enterprises, associated enterprises, but the, the umbrella holding them is, is a Buddhist practice and, and framework and thinking, you know, a whole conceptualization of the world where we, they were supporting each other. And so I began to feel that the, you know, unless there's some philosophical link, it's very difficult to see these isolated small businesses succeeding in, in quite, quite a <coughs> um, hostile business climate. 
I mean, we, we did, you know, when I saw Hustler, we did a lot of things in terms of organizing finance and, and uh, putting in marketing um, strategies and stuff. It was still very difficult. Some of them did succeed. The, the Mehi, the newspaper, it's the biggest newspaper in, in uh, Botswana today. There's print works associated with it. There's different, there's a pottery, there's different f um, uh, businesses that succeeded quite well, but when you look at all that we tried, they, it's actually quite quite a small percentage. Um, and then around that time, I, I got to know about the, the, the organization workshop. Um, I heard about it from a, from a chap called Ian Cherit, who had worked with Demoraish um, for a little bit in Latin America and had had a lot of, had been influenced very strongly by Ivan Labra. Um, and I loved the idea of the organization workshop, so we, we asked Cherit to come and run one at Saroy. And um, all of our staff went into it except me. I, I kind of held the organization together so that everybody else could be there. And, but I found it very, very exciting. You know, people come from different parts of Botswana, worked on a, on a women's cooperative, and transformed it in a period of three weeks, you know, with, with putting in water tanks and irrigation, doubling the area under cultivation, building a chicken house, building um, residential areas where, that they could rent out for to passing travelers and stuff. It, it was, but, the, you know, I like that combination of the very practical achievements, but then the, you know, the observing my colleagues afterwards behaving completely differently in the organization with a um, far uh, a, a greater kind of awareness than, than I could have imagined about what's needed to make an organization work. So I, I loved the concept. I hadn't yet got deeply into the theory um, but over the over the years, I I have got um, very immersed in the theory behind the organization workshop. And the one idea that Demoraish has, which immediately rang true for me, is the idea of two two planes of enterprise: the societal enterprise and the the immediate bounded enterprise that we're involved in. So once again, the, you know, this thing that had gave great meaning, had this unbounded dimension, and even the organization workshop itself, being able to bring people from all walks of life, um, I liked very much. I'm putting you to sleep, huh? No, no, I'm, I go to sleep anyway, it doesn't matter what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> but I am listening very carefully. Okay, Are, am I, am I, is there anything I should kind of provide more detail? Or? Yeah, I think it would be good to uh, provide more detail. Uh, at some point, do you, would you like to take a, a rest and another coffee? I'm okay for now. Okay, okay. Well, um, let, let's. Uh, so some of this, I think. Uh, um, I think you could maybe explain some of the main concepts, uh, even though Evelyn read the book. So uh, I think she already knows some of it. But I think it would be good anyway to uh, kind of l l lay out on the table a few c concepts in addition to the, um, the, the the two planes of enterprise, which of course is, mm -hmm. is, 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 is crucial. So uh, the, c the things around uh, Merasian theory, huh? Yes. So not yet getting to the Kurt Lewin stuff and all of that? Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. Okay, so, so I think there's, there's some really um, Some really fascinating parts of of Merasian thought, and and um, the the one thing that w where his uh, theory kind of paralleled my own experience in life was um, when talking about different levels of of awareness or different levels of consciousness, and. Um, so he talks about three. I've become aware since then that Freer had also put different levels of awareness. But um, 
he talks about on the one hand the, the naive, naive awareness, where, which is often associated with people who, who are in a, a rural setting, um, not brought up very in any way uh, analyzing and questioning, but more or less accepting what is. And so the naive uh, um, or childlike awareness um, ascribes problems to, to um, either to, to f God being against me or someone bewitching me or, or uh, having transgressed some, some code and therefore being punished. So not understanding at all what, what the causes of, of, of any trouble is, but um, having a kind of uh, almost a superstitious explanation for why anything would happen. If, if the rains don't come, it's mm -hmm. because um, girls are wearing short mm -hmm. mini skirts and shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. it's because we didn't thank the, the ancestors. You know, I, I've, see, I've seen that in, in Chile, and um, also I'm, uh, I've been reading quite a bit of anthropology, and one of the things that struck me is the importance of magic and superstition in, uh, in the history of the human species. It's much greater than I would have thought without actually looking into what, what's actually happened. So. Um, I, I, that sort of resonates. He's not just talking about a small experience in a corner of the world, but something mm. that is quite widespread. So, so I also have come to feel that that magic is is an important part of who we are, you know, mm -hmm. and and that there's there's a lot of wisdom in in all of those um, bodies of knowledge and, and practice. Mm. So, so the, the idea of of naive awareness isn't to to distance from that or to to say there's no value in that but it's more the sense of of some of people who who we find every day who who um you know just feel that well, you know that things are against me you know I, not not bothering to really get to grips with it so he talks about that level of awareness and then talks about the next, which is critical awareness. And um, where you start to understand the, the, the causes of problems and the interrelationships and the structural issues. So, so I've got, uh, for a while, spent a lot of time looking at all these issues around globalization and you know, the World Bank and the IMF and all of these things. And you get people who, who really understand everything about it, about how the system is not working for the world's poor, and, and they can explain it in great detail, but actually don't know what to do about it. Um, so the most that will ever happen is, is, a, is a protest, you know, on, on the street. This, this is wrong. And, and so very keenly observed, um, very good critical thinking, understanding causes of, of problems. And in fact, that's where Freer's thought went, you know, to conscientization, to becoming aware of, of uh, where, you know, the root causes of, of problems and, and by implication, what needs to be addressed. And Freer then goes, the furthest he goes is the idea of problem solving, of working on something and gaining new knowledge as you're doing it. But hello, Justine, how are you? Good, how are you? Fine, thank you. You're looking very healthy. Cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it's okay. It'll, it's, a, it's the best moment of the morning, don't worry. <laughs> um, so, so Dimmer, I mean, Dimmer Reich explicitly says that, that you need to move from, from critical awareness to organizational awareness, that that's the key. And, and so for large numbers of people who, who are um, trapped in a cycle of, of poverty, it's not enough to understand the causes of poverty and to, to see, you know, we're, we're in a, in this case, you know, the most uh, unequal society in the world. And, the, you know, those are the guys that have got the money and the land 
and who employ and who don't pay enough, in, you know, and kind of be able to describe very accurately what's happened. But you need to know what to do to to move it. And um, so, so the whole for him the whole uh, uh, issue is then to move large numbers of people to organizational awareness, and and in a creative sense, whereas it's not just um, protesting and burning, but actually creating a new world that, that makes more, more sense, you know, that, that works for everybody in it. So that, those, that's, that's one of Demoratius' concepts that I quite liked. Then the concept of capacitation is, is another one, where, f um, I don't know, somewhere around 1989, I think, the World Bank got into this idea that, that you know, what's needed is to to um, uh, engage in a strategy to to uh, build capacity in different areas, and so this phrase "capacity building" has become it's uh, you, f you see it forever, and it and so you'll it it kind of gives license to all sorts of really ineffectual practices. So we well understand, for instance, in the area that I was working, which was small enterprise development, that you need, you need financial management, y you need good uh, s stock control, you need uh, quality control in the production process. Um, y y yeah, all th okay, different parts of the business. But then you'd get courses run on financial management and, and they take people from from different enterprises, put them together in a room, teach about about business plans and cash flow projections, and then send them back to the enterprises. Because and it was all seen as <coughs> great because now that's one capacity you need, you know, and and you you then take other people from the business, you te teach them about marketing and some others that you, you teach about quality control. So the thing is that they don't, they, they don't build one on another because all of them are, are taken out of context of the enterprise, that the people involved find it very difficult to relate what they're doing, what's being taught in the classroom to what's happening back home. So, but that's just one example of endless courses run under the name of capacity building, with the idea that you can, once you've a analytically uh, determine that they're different components to the business, you can then take them out and, and train people on them and then, and then it, magically it will all come together. And so Demarais's approach is completely uh, perpendicular to that. He says that, that first of all you've got to, you can only learn about the business in the context of the business. So you can't learn to drive a car by, by learning the clutch one day and the steering wheel the next and then the accelerator and then you finally get into a car and say, well, let's put it together. It won't happen. You've got to learn in the car how to drive, how to change the gears, how to use the, the brakes, the clutch, the accelerator. And, and so he says it's like that with, with any enterprise as well. You can only learn all these different parts of the enterprise within, uh, with the in interrelationship with the other parts of the enterprise, if you're learning business management, at the same time you're looking at stock control and you're looking at marketing and so on. So, so he, he talks then about capacitation, which is working with a whole with a whole system, if you like, and it's and it's practical combined with theoretical uh, insights, and and um, that felt like much truer to life than than this capacity building concept. And I began to realize as well that that in many other ways we western thought has this penchant to to analyze into components something that's whole and then focus on the on the component you know so um I, it much later in, in life there was this experience i had where um, a, a large donor had set up three interlinked initiatives one around leadership, one around integrated rural development, and one around s f small farmer support. And then when they were looking at it, they, they felt it wasn't working quite well. And their idea was to stop all the initiatives and start again. 
with a new with one and, and at that time you know, analytically it made perfect sense but but for me when talking it through with them I was saying that there are two kinds of system you know there's the frog and the bicycle and and they both you can see the interrelationship w between the different parts and um, what makes them go for forward and back and and how um, they function as a, how the, the whole system functions each part's got a discrete uh, role you know the legs of the frog are for hopping and the tongue for getting the food and all that and it, it makes it work but with a bicycle you can take it apart and put you could put another saddle you could put different pedals put it together and it would work but with a frog once you take it apart it doesn't work again so so um, those two those two systems but actually um, I, I see often that that Western theory when looking at any social issue they analyze it like that they take it take something out of its context and try and work with it and so capacity building is a bit like that taking some discrete element that's that you s you've analyzed as discrete but actually is linked to a whole lot of other things separate it and and uh, try and make it work M try and make the whole work better sorry i'm rambling a little bit now but but that no, that, no that's good you, you're doing you're doing everything ro everything right you're not, you're not <laughs> <Okay. rambling. laughs> so yeah so capacitation i think uh, for me was like a really really important concept um, I'm gone. Like I've talked already about these two planes of enterprise, you know, which which I think is 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 a very very vital idea. The yesterday I I had to present to a group of people brought together by the Department of Public Enterprises and it's people from from uh, state-owned enterprises and from the big mining groups and it's looking at at, at the, the idea of uh, you know what do we need to really make the economy work and there's this interesting conversation that comes up that the, the everyday discussion is all about competition we compete with each other and actually, if we do that, there's no chance at all of getting the, the economy really humming. Well, there needs to be a, a common vision and certain agreements about how we're going to do it. And, and uh, I found that fascinating, you know, because in some ways, well, not in some ways, every day in the newspapers, you know, you, ha you have this notion that it's about these different entities competing with each other. And... and um, I think, Howard, what you've said theoretically, it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. that the competition makes everybody go bankrupt in the end. Mm -hmm. But you could actually see it playing out in real life. And, and so again, mm -hmm. when I was listening, I was listening to them talking about the need to, to pay attention to the unbounded <laughs> enterprise, you know, the, the societal enterprise that we're all part of, that mm -hmm. that's the cohering thing that would make sense for these individuals. Mm -hmm. yeah. It played out in real life in Chile also. We uh, had a military dictatorship which um, came in in 1973 uh, and their program was Chicago economics. They had actually, <laughs> before they uh, took military power by violence, had actually sent military officers to Chicago to study. I, I met some of them. I happened to know an American undersecretary of state who came down shortly after to help organized the Central Bank of Chile and we were in a hotel room and this series of military officers would troop in and talk to him who had been to Chicago before uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the military coup happened. So they actually, with unlimited military force and with completely, uh, what's the word, uh, no scruples in terms of how much violence they were willing to use in terms of disappearing people and so on, uh, were intent on putting into practice the theoretical model of Milton Friedman and Friedrich von Hayek, and they invited both of them, both Friedman and von Hayek, came well, to Chile well. as honored guests of the government to see their philosophy being put into practice um, in, um, <laughs> with unlimited force uh, behind it. And in, in fact, it happened 
th this, this went on until 1981 uh, when the whole thing crashed. Actually, it was crashing all the time because as, the, as they put this model into practice, business after business went bankrupt. They, they couldn't function with this sort of model. And in 1881, they had a major crisis, and at that point, they, they gave up. They realized that this idea of everybody being a separate individual competing to, to the point where uh, prices go down to the cost of production and nobody makes any profit, this didn't work. It, it might be good as a polemic to attack socialism, but apart from its polemical value as an ideology, it didn't work in practice. So since 81, <laughs> uh, Chile has had a, a much more pragmatic model where they simply effect, accept the fact that businesses tend to be monopolistic. They seek to get out of competition by not competing too hard on prices. They're, as they're in South Africa, like there's a big five of this and a big five of that. Well, Chile is the same way. There are a few industries, and uh, to, 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 together with this uh, more pragmatic approach to capitalism, where you just accept its faults and it doesn't run without its faults, uh, the, uh, uh, has, has gone a big boom in the social responsibility business. Now there are all kinds of ratings. Every uh, Industries are all rated in Chile, and every year there are prizes for who's most socially responsible. So uh, there's been a, uh, uh, so there's a practical example. Uh, an another case where I worked out in real life that uh, the, uh, the theory of pure competition doesn't work in practice and also doesn't work in theory. It would be great to have that as a little case study, you know? <laughs> that could because be. despite the fact it didn't work in practice, it's still, it's still preached as the only way forward. That's know? right. Even, <laughs> so it still preaches the only way forward, even though um, we could give many examples of it not working, and we could also show, even Adam Smith realized that uh, when you have, Smith says that when many merchants get into the same trade, and compete with each other, their profits decline. <laughs> mm -hmm. I need some water. Is this a water? Or? Uh, no, I like to some water. Can you? Maybe Justine will get us some water. I think. Thanks, Justine. Um. <coughs> so, I, um, I, you know, actually, you know who's actually done studies uh, that tend to show this? Michael Porter. Michael Porter is a professor of business strategy at Harvard Business School, and he studied industries. I can give you the quotes. In fact, I, I actually have it all written out, but it's in Spanish. I hate translating. But uh, he's actually shown industry by industry how the successful industries are the ones where there's a gentleman's agreement not to compete too much, especially on price. Hmm. And he, if anybody, has done exhaustive empirical studies of you know, why businesses succeed and why they fail. And they succeed when they get into a niche where there are barriers to entry, where they have brand loyalty, where they're able to do uh, sales parts and repairs that are on follow-ups on sales that, are, that make up for selling at a low price. So there are all sorts of strategies to avoid the uh, ideal model, uh, which in fact get people in a comfortable position where they can continually make a profit. Well, I'm getting. Well, I think that does have to do with unbounded organization in the respect that it's a, it's sort of a story about how you have to be open-minded and realize that uh, you know there there are many different ways of thinking about things, but uh, and I suppose at least it's the beginning of some sense of the two levels of enterprise in the sense that at least in Chile there's a very strong ideology today uh, of uh, social responsibility of business. And in Harvard, they're promoting the idea of uh, shared value now. That's the, the latest uh, sort of slogan among the business elite uh, in the U.S. and internationally. Shared value. Shared value. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it, it, I think, I, my suggestion is that that goes together with realizing that the old theory of uh, everybody gains from a free competitive market uh, is not working and cannot be used as to justify the system. The theory of the consumer sovereign and everything works to benefit the consumer uh, is, is not workable. So there has to be some other way of justifying the system. 
And to be consistent, I think we have to go with Gavin's idea of the, and, and de Marais' idea of, of the two enterprise planes, but we're, we're kind of moving in that direction with the idea of social responsibility and with the mm -hmm. idea of various stakeholders and with the idea of shared value. Hmm. Um, should we go on to the small group stuff? Yes, let's do that. But uh, did you get your water? I've got the water, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Morongo hasn't come yet? Evelyn, mm -hmm. how's from your side? Is there anything that, that you think needs clarifying or? More detail. You want Justine to put the camera on you while you talk? No, uh, clarifying. Perhaps um, <coughs> some more information about who Demorais is. Oh, okay. Mm. So, so um, Clodomir Santos Demorais is, is still alive. He's, I think he's 86 or 88, um, a Brazilian. And um, a very uh, colorful character by all accounts. Um, he was a jazz musician and a journalist. He was um, a lawyer. Yeah, I get emails from him every now and then. They're all about the parties he throws. Are you serious? <laughs> yes. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. I don't know why, how I got on his email list. Somehow I did. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, in the, in the time of the peasant leagues in Brazil, um, late 50s and early early 60s, um, he was one of a, a group of, of, I suppose, urban professionals who supported the emergence of, of the peasant leagues and who, um, he, he, he was elected as a member of parliament at one stage. Huh? Yeah, I think it was the state parliament. The state the parliament, Sifri. yeah. Yeah, so in the northeast of Brazil, Recife, and um, they would use their their status, parliamentary immunity, being, being to to work with people in the rural areas and help them understand the the kind of um, room for organisation provided by the by the laws, which. Um, I think it's a little bit similar to our case in South Africa in the early 70s, where trade unions weren't banned, but that they'd been crushed. You know, but there was the room in the law that you could form once if you could form them, they were perfectly legal. So there was similar things in the in the agrarian reform laws that if if people knew how to use them, they they could really make some headway. Mm -hmm. And so worked quite a, quite a lot on that, and and um, at some stage got detained then by the by the military dictatorship and shared a cell for I think 18 months with Paulo Freire who who he'd grown up with and who they were best friends um, and then uh, event he uh, they eventually got out of prison Freire went to to Europe and joined the World Council of Churches and um, his work immediately got translated into English and spread through the church network. So Freer became very well known and famous. Demoraish stayed in Latin America and um, became a very um, uh, effective and sought after um, professional by United Nations organizations, the FAO, ILO, in a whole series of different rural, uh, you know, land reform and, and uh, um, farmer development programs, and and so he uh, the the origins of his method, which then later we've developed and be is called the organization workshop, was in a they were running a clandestine course on uh, on uh, agrarian law. And it was in a um, an urban area, a, a poor part of town, police patrols all around, and they assembled, I think, 36 people in this tiny home, very three or four rooms. Um, they had to assemble without being noticed, so 
take a while, you know, coming in one by one. They stayed together for, for a few weeks, I think three weeks, um, in a small space, a lot of people. They, had, they were giving the lectures uh, on the law and learning all about it. They had to then, um, you know, really observe, ma make sure they weren't noticed and not much noise. But for, the, for that long period of time, they, they had to work out, you know, we've got one toilet, there's 36 of us. So, you know, there's one place we, they need to work out rotation for, for um, bathing, or, you know, washing, bathing, for, for also washing of clothes, for cooking of food, for, for um, you know, the basics of life, but, but then to reproduce the, the, the lecture notes, to do the assignments. So a whole lot of different tasks that they, they had to do together in a very, very uh, organized fashion and, and, and quietly <laughs> so that they weren't noticed. So they went through the course and then about uh, three or four months later, he went round to um, the different um, villages where people came from to see how they were doing. And what he found is that, that all of the, each of the participants had, after the course, had really um, achieved startling, had, had made startling achievements at home in, in organizationally, really built their organization, had moved into leadership positions, um, had, had achieved a great deal that, but completely differently from how they had been before the course. The, the, the legal knowledge was, you know, it was okay, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but it became clear that the common thing that they learned was about how to organize that this experience of, of being all together, one, this certain uh, set of resources that they could use, that they had to work out how to do it, had somehow conditioned them, you know, had, had created the conditions for them to learn organization. So he, he then had that, um, uh, like that, that uh, idea that um, a, a large number of people, if forced to share a common pool of resources, will learn how, how to organize. So, so he tried it out, and the, the stories, uh, I mean, one of the first stories I heard about him was from Ivan Labra, and it's about Demarais arriving in a, in a rural area, um, in a little pickup truck, and then parking under a tree and getting out with a loud hailer and saying, uh, tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, there's a workshop, workshop, tomorrow morning, any, everybody's welcome, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, you know, tell your friends, tell your family, everybody tomorrow morning. And the next morning at 10, there's a little crowd gathered around the tree in the truck and wait and see, everyone here, and they agreed at some point, yeah, everyone's here. And he said, okay, so what are we going to do? So, and they said, but, you know, you're the one who called the workshop. What's the workshop about? He said, I don't know. What do you want it to be about? I said, hang on, hang on. And then he said, look, what we've got, we've got this truck, we've got the loud hailer, and we've got me. What do you want to do? So the story goes that, the, you know, by the next day, they were, the workshop was well underway. Um, he was giving literacy classes under the tree. Um, the truck was booked from six in the morning through to eight o'clock at night doing, uh, giving driving lessons for all the people who wanted to learn how to drive. Um, then by two weeks later, you know, the literacy classes had developed some, some were, you know, th there was more, uh, there was a numeracy class run by somebody else um, there were some some of the people who'd moved to a certain level were writing uh, a history of the village together. There were, he was he was still working, so there was a lot more happening. There was sports activities with with this uh, <laughs> this megaphone, this loud hailer. Um, all the kids in the afternoon, and the truck was 
leaving early in the morning at about three o'clock to take produce to the market in town and then come back with, with uh, what people needed to be bought in the village and then start the, the driving lesson. So, um, you know, that, that was his theory playing out. That so so the, 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 the common pool of resources was him, the, the truck and the, and the megaphone, the, the loud head. Um, and, but in that story, there's another thing, which is that, that um, you know, the first people learn through activity itself. So for the, for the first step is that the, 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 what you have suggests the activity. The tools you have suggest the activity. So, so the, the, the phrase that everyone loves is the object teaches. You know, the, teaches you what you can do. So the truck and the loud head and Demarais suggest certain activity. But the activity itself then throws up new ideas about what's possible. Hence, you know, you can see the, the, the kind of development of the activity over time. So, so based on those kind of experiments, he then started to develop the method that, that became called, what's called today the organization workshop. And I think the the piece that, that I think is is um, is brilliant, but but which at some stage was against all the orthodoxy of popular education, <laughs> is that is the idea of of um, giving theoretical giving lectures. He calls them lectures. We call them here learning sessions because we're more diffident. But but um, um, with the idea that. There's a set of knowledge that, that you don't wake up by getting people together and saying, OK, so what do we know about this, you know, human evolution? And then put it together and, ah, there we've got it. But actually, you, you can come and, and tell a story about human evolution. Some people might know a bit of it, some, but, but you, you give it there, there's, a, there's, some, there's worth in giving a big body of theory, if you like, for people to work with. So, Always from the beginning, there's been this 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 element of people learning by doing, and and um, from the doing also picking up new possibilities for doing. But then the other side is this is this theoretical um, immersion, if you like, in a, in immersion in a body of theory. So and when when I've analysed that afterwards, I realised that that actually that there's an incredible value in that in that theory because on the one hand it gives a, a kind of meta narrative a, a big story that everybody can align with and can understand and we can understand our own history in terms of but also giving concepts that everybody can start to work with so it creates a um, a kind of uh, yeah. I would say it creates, it creates a community story yeah or uh, an organization story, so pe people can uh, uh, organize because they they see their organization as part of a larger process, and yeah. they can communicate because they share a vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah, and we've we've seen that uh, what you've just said. We've seen that playing out here. You know, so the mm -hmm. there's there's a now well researched and written about example of of an organization workshop we did here in a community called Bockfontein, which was very divided at the beginning, two groups more or less fighting each other for the same land that they were on. And uh, with a lot of tensions, people from different countries all staying together, um, a lot of violence in the community, a lot of crime. And then, you know, after the organization workshop, completely working together as one community and, and very, you know, a sense of real purpose and, and appreciating the diversity, the, the strength that came from, the, that comes from the diversity of different backgrounds, different contributions, different knowledge bases. Mm -hmm. And um, when, when they were interviewed by researchers about, you know, why that was, you know, they said, well, it's, it's uh, you know, in the organization workshop, 
we, we realized we all have the same big story actually in the immediate, you know, we come from the same place, we're all part of the same uh, movement of people and, and the immediate past history is, is, it doesn't differentiate us at all, it, it can only strengthen us but it doesn't, it doesn't make us enemies, it can't. So, so there was that, I mean, as you say, you know, the, this, this, there was a community story and, and there was an ability to, to situate apparent differences within it as, and, and see them as sources of strength. So, so yeah, Dimurash, I, I think, um, I've never met Dimurash and, and uh, have never really had the inclination to and um, but, but by all accounts he's had a really rather remarkable life I mean he was awarded uh, some big honor in, in Brazil last year I think oh, I don't know yeah mm -hmm. and but Paulo Freer six months before Freer died was um, awarded an honorary doctorate by Rondonia University mm -hmm. and so they he sitting up on the stage and they did the, it's, a, it's not called a eulogy what's it called when they talk about your life work it's a mm -hmm. it's like a pin of praise you know this uh -huh. is this is what Howard did mm -hmm. anyway so so they give this whole thing on the contributions of Paulo Freire and and how important uh, what a seminal thinker and what an important contribution and Freer sitting there little little old man on the on the stage mm -hmm. and at long last it's time for him to speak mm -hmm. and then he gets up and says well you know it's very kind of you all these wonderful things you've said about you me very very honored thank you so much I, I must tell you though that I I feel a bit of a fraud because uh, the person who taught me everything that I've done is sitting right here in the audience and you don't even know his name <laughs> and um, uh, Clodomir, please, won't you come and stand with me? And then Clodomir gets up and comes and stands, these two old friends standing there. And he says, actually, I haven't even gone as far as Clodomir. You know, um, he's done much more than me and his impact is far greater. But, but for some reason, people know about me. And I, the only thing I can think is that I joined the church. <laughs> 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 and... and um, but okay, so, so that's a very nice, uh, a, a nice gesture, I think, by Freer. Um, but it does speak to their relationship, you know. So, so um, it's interesting that, you know, uh, Moravians, some of them, quite hostile to Freer, because, you know, he didn't understand, you know, but whereas it's apparent that the two of them actually liked each other very much. And so Dimmerreich, even today, won't hear a word against Freer, you know. So, so yeah. Um, with with Freerian, you know, the, F Freer's method um, of, you know, this towards conscientization, creating codes that you know, teaching literacy through these codes where you take a, a, a like a hot theme and, and talk around it and then from that start building the words and so on. We started to use it here in South Africa before I went back to Botswana, so in the 70s. And then when I got to Botswana, one of the things in around 85 with my two co-founders of CORD, we, we went through this thing called the called training for transformation which was which came out of the catholic church mm -hmm. and it was putting together some of freer's thinking especially mm -hmm. the whole idea of of problematizing mm -hmm. um with liberation theology and with what was then called uh, the po popular education and um so I later learned more about popular education, but essentially the, the method that we learned w was was a small group method where you'd have usually around 15 people and they're very definite rules on how to do things. So, so um, the idea of a lecture would be out, that you don't 
work like that, but, but it's all about working with people's own knowledge and experience. And so it, you create experiences in the room that you then learn from and, and generalize from. And very, very powerful, tra uh, they call it training. I, I hate the word training these days, but, but uh, they very powerful training method. And um, we went through this and it was, it was very effective. And I, I never, I found it difficult to understand the absolute hostility towards it from, from Latin American practitioners that, that, uh, that I met who'd been working with Demaraj. And what I then learned is that this uh, popular education had been used quite a lot um, by, by the CIA and through in different moments of, of, uh, of I don't know, you know, like the, within Chile, within different countries to destroy or to, to impart a certain uh, ideology in, in a very subtle way amongst, amongst people. So, so um, uh, there's a whole layer of, of Latin American activists who really hate anything to do with small group work and anything to do with popular education. Now that was complete news to me because I'd, I experienced it as, as something uh, very valuable, those techniques in, in getting a whole group of people to, to participate in learning about something. Um, but um, later I then learned the, where the, the method came from, you, you know, the, the, this whole the small group work. Um, are you wanting to come in at all on, on, on the popular education, the Latin America thing? Um, not, not, not right now. Okay. Um, I, 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 do, I do feel I could use a break and a cup of chocolate. Mm -hmm. Should we do that now? We can. Okay.